Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted and gave for Muhammad the entirety of religion and allowed for him to decide what the halal was and what the haram was mm. and what religion all together would be. Muhammad was given the freedom to formulate the religion as he saw fit. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد إلهم المهدين وسلم تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brother and friend Dr. Irfan وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته وسلامك thank you for joining me thank you so much for having me again so today we want to talk about uh, what Allah سبحانه وتعالى gave the Prophet Solomon in terms of uh, the gifts and his kingship and his kingdom uh, that he was given uh, versus what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi was given. So uh, it's known in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam that one king in particular uh, was given a kingdom the likes of none other who had ever come before him. You know, and he was uh, very much favored by God in in that regards. Uh, he was given. Uh, authority and ability in the land. He was a king and, um, you know, there were not too many prophets and messengers that were sent in history um, that were actually given the ability to rule. A few of them were, for example, like David and Solomon. Uh, there was Zulkarnain. There was Joseph, uh, but not many of them actually uh, had a kingdom. Rather, they were oppressed in their land and they were preaching the word or calling towards God, usually while there was an oppressor or a tyrannical uh, king that was in the place. So the fact that he had a kingdom, he had authority, he had rule, he had a government, uh, which we, he was the head of in this physical world is already uh, kind of a special thing. Uh, all prophets and messengers, obviously, they're, they're sent, and, and the Qur'an states very clearly that there's not a single messenger that was sent except that he was to be obeyed. So um, all of them, uh, God intended that they rule, but very few of them actually had the ability uh, to rule um, during this, the, you know, all of, uh, from mankind's beginning, from Adam's time, all the way up till uh, now, but Solomon had more than just your average king or your average ruler. Uh, his kingdom uh, was extremely vast and he was given uh, great wisdom and he was given the ability to understand the logic of the animals. The, the, he was able to, to understand their, their languages. And this is very well known in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They all agree upon uh, this fact and the stories of uh, Solomon's uh, interactions with uh, various creatures uh, from the hudhud all the way to the ant and beyond are recorded in the Quran and also uh, in the narrations of the Jews, the traditions and legends of the, of the Jewish people. And uh, he also had the ability to control the wind. Um, he could command the wind to lift him up and make him, uh, you know, basically take him from one place to another. Uh, the narration, the Jewish narrations talk about how Solomon had this gigantic carpet. And uh, this is kind of where we get a lot of these legends that have to do with the flying carpet. It comes actually from uh, the story uh, of Solomon, from Solomon's times, that he had this gigantic carpet that was extremely long and, and wide. And, and uh, 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 entire battalions of his army uh, were able to fit on top of this carpet and they would be transported uh, from one location uh, to another. Um, he also had the ability to command and control the, uh, the spirits, the demonic spirits, the jinn. Um, he had authority over them, the shayateen. They had to obey him. He had gained uh, the knowledge and the wisdom 
uh, and the understanding whereby he was able to uh, subjugate these demonic spirits and entities and and jinn to do his bidding. Um, and they built for him and they went to war for him and he was able to entrap them uh, in bottles and in various other objects and the narrations uh, once again especially in Judaism they describe a lot of the uh, adventures that Solomon had uh, with uh, trapping and enslaving uh, these different uh, demonic uh, spirits, and and how he would do so, and the arts of the of the quote unquote magic that he was, um, you know, he was familiar with, or or that he was well versed in, um, is a topic that we can go into in further detail, inshallah, in other episodes, and. Uh, that was the extent, really, of uh, Solomon's kingdom, and he built Solomon's temple, uh, and he did so with the aid of these spirits that um, would would come and 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 do his bidding. And he was um, in the Bible and the Torah. He is, um, you know, he had seven hundred uh, permanent wives, uh, many of them which were princesses and royalties from uh, the surrounding countries. And he also had 300 concubines. Um, he was extremely rich. The riches that the kingdom of Israel had at the time were the likes that no one had ever seen before. And so he was... He, he had a kingdom, and he also had physical riches, and he had authority over men, and he had authority over jinn, and he had authority uh, over the animals. They used to obey him. And wow. even uh, in the narrations, you know, uh, they basically speak about the, um, you know, this, they, they speak about this story, um, which is actually present in the Qur'an. Um, when Solomon sends a letter to the Queen of Sheba, and basically it says in there, and it is it is from Solomon, and it is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the Jewish narrations, it speaks about how Solomon wrote a letter to the Queen of Sheba uh, when the Hudhud bird came and told him that. Uh, you know, there was a woman out there that she had this great kingdom and uh, they were worshiping the sun. He writes her this letter and in it, it says, this is from Solomon and Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And then, um, you know, it proceeds to state that, you know, I am commanding you basically to, um, you know, submit to me and, uh, you know, obey me because I was appointed by God over all of the lands. And if you don't do so, then uh, you're going to be attacked basically by uh, the beasts of the earth and, and, and the winds of the, of the sky, etc. Yeah? yeah. So uh, he had great authority and he was respected by, and the Queen of Sheba ends up traveling down to Solomon to pledge allegiance to him and to uh, submit to his will. Right. Yes. So where is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi from all of that? And this is the, the question that comes to uh, mind, you know, and this is not just a question that comes to mind today, uh, but it, it was a question that was actually posed by uh, the people back in the day of the, in the life of the Prophet Muhammad and in the lives of the Imams. Uh, they would say to themselves, well, you know, now that the Quran has told us these stories that we didn't know before, and some of the people, the Arabs at the time, they did know um, these stories because there were Christians and there were Jews that were living um, in that uh, area around the Prophet Muhammad, um, you know, and people that had converted from Christianity and Judaism and therefore were were familiar with these stories. They they wondered like, okay, and they had expectations, you know, here they are, they're reading about Moses and he's splitting the sea and he has all of these miracles and there's this pillar of light that's going, uh, a fire that's traveling with them and a cloud that's, you know, overshadowing them. And, you know, he's able to throw down his staff and it turns into a serpent and he's able to bring out his hand and, and there it is white, uh, you know, with no harm. And, you know, he's able to hear the voice of God and you have these other prophets and messengers that God is with them and he's speaking to the Israelites. And you have uh, Solomon, obviously, and David that have this 
this kingdom that's mm. uh, just astonishing. Um, you know, so if the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi is is an Arab prophet who is supposed to be the final prophet, and he's a prophet who prayed, um, you know, in uh, Jerusalem on the night journey with and led in prayer. All of the prophets and messengers, they're all there, including Solomon and David, and they're behind him. That means what? That means that Muhammad is their imam. Mm. Muhammad is their imam in prayer. He's leading them in prayer. He's between the prophets and the messengers and between God. So that means that Muhammad is more special. He's better. He's closer to God than uh, Solomon, David, Moses, Jesus, these people. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said that even Jesus, the son of Mary, you know, in the end times would come back and pray behind the Mahdi. Mm-hmm. And so the Mahdi is also the successor of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is, uh, you know, in that case, like better or the Imam of Jesus, the mm-hmm. son of Mary. So uh, you know how do we how do we understand all that and and they wondered and they wondered what is what has God given the Prophet Muhammad and uh, did and and so many so many Muslims will come back with the response and say well you know the the Prophet Muhammad he had great miracles and 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 he did. Uh, but then they'll say that the greatest miracle is, is the Quran. And people don't so much understand what does that mean that the greatest miracle is the Quran. Now, there's a little bit of a confusion on that. Okay, Moses, he splits the sea. Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he splits the moon. That's that's understood. Mm-hmm. Uh, splitting the moon is a much uh, <laughs> you know greater uh, task right. than splitting the sea. But what does it mean when the Muslims say that the greatest miracle uh, is the Quran? This is a very good, <laughs> interesting question. This is the first thing they say. And you always think, well, Moses also received the Ten Commandments and brought the Torah. And how is this uh, any better? It's pretty much the same thing. So I always wondered about that. And I'm sure you have the answer. Yeah. So, so um, you know, like we said, Moses splits the sea, Muhammad splits the moon. Um, Solomon, he's speaking to the animals, right? And he's understanding the animals. And you have narrations where the Prophet Muhammad is also understanding uh, the animals or the Imams from the Ahl bayt are able to interpret what the camel is stating and even what branches from the trees or plants of the earth, what they are also stating. Um, or that there would be like pebbles in the hands of the prophet that would speak to him. And so uh, that also is greater because you have inanimate objects or plants that are um, that are able to speak and the prophet understand them. Uh, and also he understands the uh, the language of the animals. But but what does that mean? Like, OK, so so how then does the prophet Muhammad, though, have beyond a shadow of a doubt a kingdom that is much greater than Solomon. Mm. You know, because if he's better than Solomon, if he's the Imam of Solomon, then God must have given him something that he didn't give any of the other prophets and messengers. There's something that has to make Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam special. And we get this in several narrations uh, from the Ahl Bayt Alayhim Salam. Um, that that uh, has in it really like an, an incredible secret and something that uh, most of the people, um, you know, either don't know or they don't pay attention to the meaning behind it, right? The weight of it. In one narration, one of the imams from the Ahl Bayt state that the Prophet Muhammad had gotten to a point where God uh, basically commends him and says to him, you are upon great morals and manners. Mm-hmm. You are, you have reached to the epitome of goodness, of good morals, good character, right? Right. And uh, you have other narrations uh, from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu saying, and what is religion except for love, All right? Is religion anything but love? Mm-hmm. And there is this emphasis also on the fact that in some of the narrations that the entirety of religion 
is basically uh, good morals and manners, and 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 that a human being uh, it be a good person who loves goodness and wants goodness. So the Prophet Muhammad, at some point with God is told by God and commended in the Holy Quran that he has the best, most perfect morals and manners. Mm. Okay. And so God rewards him and he entrusts him. And the narrations from the Ahl Bayt state that the Prophet was given Everything that Solomon was given, but he was given that which Solomon and no other prophet before was given. Mm. And then the Imam would recite the verse from the Quran and so give or withhold without. account so give or withhold without account and then the imam would recite another verse and the verse would state and that which the messenger gives you take it and that which he forbids you on for, forbids you from then abstain Same. from it mm. And then the Imam explains and he says to his companion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted and gave for Muhammad the entirety of religion and allowed for him to decide what the halal was and what the haram was mm. and what religion altogether would be. Muhammad, unlike all of the other prophets and messengers, was given the freedom to formulate the religion as he saw fit. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes, yes. Do you understand the, the, the magnitude of the powers that were given to the prophet Muhammad? So each and every prophet and messenger from before they were they were commanded they were given gifts and authority and miracles etc but they were always commanded by god to stick to you know and to command their people mm. to particular rules and regulations they didn't have the ability to take something that God had commanded and cross it out, right? Mm. Or switch it with something else mm. or to create, you know, their own uh, laws without God's permission or sanctioning of it. Wow. But in the sense of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given the total freedom to formulate the religion of Islam as he saw fit. Mm. So God was always the lawgiver, then Muhammad sallallahu became the lawgiver. God was always the lawgiver from before. Mm. Muhammad sallallahu wow. became the lawgiver afterwards. Mm. And this, the imams uh, stated, became something which the imams, the successors after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi inherited. Wow. And for that reason, the narrations state that the successors of Muhammad are better than all of the other prophets and the messengers mm. because they have in their hands the keys to formulate, change, um, implement, make a part of or take out of religion whatever it is that they saw fit. Right. Now, we have a scene in the Bible where Simon Peter is given the, the, the keys to the kingdoms of the heavens and the kingdoms of the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. So he is given the ability to, to 
grant commands or to state things and it becomes obligatory for the people to abide by all right yeah. Yeah. so his word becomes the word of christ mm. yeah right but he still had to work within the same boundaries that jesus came with right okay mm -hmm. the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had the power to and the freedom from god to break and take away all of that which came before him everything there's not even a, a basis for it and he can build religion from the bottom up he had the power to make religion whatever it is that he saw fit and that's the, that's there's a big difference there there's a that's a that's a gigantic power um that that the prophet has uh, the prophet could make it obligatory that people abstain from drinking milk for example and all of a sudden the uh, abstention from 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 milk becomes law and it becomes a law that god would uphold and he would punish those who transgress uh from you know fr from that he had the the um in the time of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh the prophet who had on his night journey landed on the spot and led the prophets and the messengers in prayer from the spot where god spoke to the israelites in the position of the the place of the ark of the covenant in the temple mm. um the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam now literally stood in the place of the ark literally stood in the place of god and he had total authority to do as he saw fit right wow it's amazing this spectacular analysis of the quran and bringing these verses that we've heard and putting into context it is quite incredible that you do overlook these things and um, it's in front of your eyes but you just can't see it yeah so by that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given a kingdom that was greater um than the kingdom uh, of solomon because solomon although he was given all of these great things um and powers and abilities and miracles um he was not given the freedom to change the law of moses he had to stick to he it to. he couldn't change it and uh, the same thing with moses um he didn't have the ability to escape from the law of abraham and in the bible he gets in very much trouble with uh you know god for not circumcising uh his son right right when right. god sought to kill moses and one of the uh, verses uh, because of the the whole uh, you know not circumcising uh, his yes. son issue but muhammad sallallahu alaihi he could change the direction of worship uh, from jerusalem uh, to mecca mm -hmm. uh, he changes the form of worship and the form of prayer and he's able to uh implement in his religion um aspects he can make a new religion that is a combination of uh laws and practices that were given to previous prophets and messengers um as he saw fit so for example one of the things which he implements as a part of his jurisprudence for example is the wudu and many of the muslims think that uh, wudu was something which the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had invented uh, but actually it's not something that he had invented it was something that the mandaeans the followers of john the baptist um you know were practicing mm -hmm. it was something that was taught to them by Uh, John it was a practice at the time um that John had given them uh, it was not a law it was just a practice um and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam made it a part of uh his law for his religion the religion of Islam that the people before they go to prayer that they have to be in this state of wudu and uh, maybe the director can place a video as we're speaking of uh footage of one of the mandaeans uh who were followers of John the Baptist as they're making wudu 
um, in the river, you can see that the if you were to come across this person and watch him make wudu, you would find that his wudu is exactly the same wudu that Muslims use today. Mm -hmm. And so the wudu itself is not a Muslim practice, but rather it was a Mandaean practice. And the Prophet Muhammad had the ability to integrate it and make it a part of his religion. And there's many examples of uh, certain aspects they took from uh, the Zoroastrian religion, um, and from Christianity and Judaism, and he made them together to 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 perfect and make a universal religion, which was supposed to be appealing to all mankind. Okay, it's interesting. Of like the Orientalists, when they <clears throat> study the life of the Prophet Muhammad, they say that he kind of invented this religion, taking from bits of Judaism, bits of these different religions, to make his religion. The Prophet Muhammad kind of essentially did do that, but he had authority from God to do what Absolutely. he did. Absolutely. You know, and he didn't take falsehood. He didn't take like things from false teachers or false religions. Mm -hmm. uh, he took sunnahs, practices. Uh, there's a big difference between a sunnah, something which uh, John is doing, mm. okay? John is cleaning himself. He's washing himself in a certain way. And then his followers copy that and they do that. There's a difference between between something a prophet did, right? Which every prophet will come with something that they're doing that other people didn't do, right? Mm -hmm. um, a certain practice, a certain way of talking or walking or eating, right? That the people would mimic them in. Uh, but this does this is different than it being a law which came down. Right. John the Baptist was still a Jew who was abiding by the laws of Moses, um, you know, like every other Jew at that time. Uh, but he was also baptizing people. He was washing people in in water. But but he never claimed that the the act of baptism itself. That hey, I'm John, and I'm bringing a new law that you guys have to abide by. And if you don't abide by, then uh, you're going to be held accountable for. Gotcha. Do you understand? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's the story of the kingdom of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, knowing that. And knowing that, knowing that Muhammad had this ability and this power um, to change the jurisprudence and to formulate his own religion, and that this this authority was given to Imam Ali salam and the Imams from the Ahl Bayt salam all the way down to the final successor uh, from the family of Muhammad. You know, so all the successors until the day of judgment inherit everything that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu had. Um, and so uh, we shouldn't then be surprised when we come across narrations from, um, you know, Muhammad and the family of Muhammad that talk about how in the time of the Qa'im, uh, he rules once by the rule of Adam and he rules another time by the rule of David and another time he rules by the rule of Moses or by Jesus. And he rules certain people by different types of sharia or things of this nature um, mm -hmm. because they have the authority to do so. Mm -hmm. And there's another narration from the Ahl Bayt where one of the Imams is sitting with his companions. And, and, and the companion is watching the Imam. And he, had, he used to follow somebody else. But then he, he he got convinced that this is actually the imam that we have to follow. So he ends up leaving his old teacher, pledging allegiance to the imam. And then he's in his presence. A man walks in and asks him about a verse in the Quran. And uh, the imam gives him the answer. And then another man walks in later and he asks about the same verse in the Quran. And the imam gives him a different answer. Mm -hmm. And so the person who is sitting there, uh, who just be became a follower of this imam, he, he something happens in his heart, he has doubt, and he says to himself, you know, that's a pretty big mistake, that within this time span, uh, the, this guy who's supposed to be the imam forgets the answer and contradicts his own self and gives another person another answer. Mm -hmm. And then a third person walks in and he asks the imam about the exact same verse again. And the imam yet gives him a different answer. 
And so the companion uh, becomes at peace again and he thinks to himself, okay, well, the imam is, give, is using taqiyya, which mm-hmm. is the concealment of truth. Maybe these people are hypocrites or, or, or non-believers really. And so the imam is giving them answers that are not particularly true or trying to throw them off uh, for the sake of mm-hmm. protecting the people. But in the end, he has this conversation with the imam and the imam tells the companion that the Ahl Bayt, the, the infallible imams from the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad, have the authority, at the very least, at the very least, they have the authority to interpret as they see fit every verse from the Quran in seven, seven different ways. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. Yes. And so that is a great power. Uh, that the imams have and a great power that they derived from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu wow. Alaihi And so they are inheritors to a kingdom. Muhammad and the family of Muhammad are inheritors to a kingdom that is greater than the kingdom of Solomon wow. because they were given all of that, but they were given, uh, they were, God delegated to them, uh, you know, his entire religion. It's like God says to Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, I trust you. You have now reached a state of complete goodness. Whatever it is that you say, whatever it is that you guide the people to, at the end, you will only guide them towards goodness. So paint whatever picture you want. Take them on whatever walk that you want. Lead them down any road. All roads will lead to me. And if you remember, there's a seal that the Prophet Muhammad had. And the seal basically stated, uh, face whatever direction you will, for verily you are victorious. And that seal kind of summarizes the message of, uh, you know, today's talk uh, and and, and proves the point. And that is that the the Prophet had reached a state of ultimate goodness that Anything that he did was acceptable, and he had now in his hands uh, all authority. Subhanallah. Kind of also reminds me of the, 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 the famous saying that where truth follows wherever Ali goes. And uh, this is just amazing. Ali is with the truth, and the truth is with Ali. Right. Subhanallah. And so, and uh, yeah, and so the, the, the greatest miracle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi is the Quran because the Quran represents the law and the word of God, right? Yes. And the word of God can be interpreted, right? And adjusted and the word of God is held by Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, they are the word of God because the Quran states whatever they give you, take it, and whatever they forbid you from, abstain from it. Anything that comes from them, any word that comes from their mouth is Quran. They are the ones whom have the ability to interpret and formulate religion, and therefore religion is a man in its truest and brightest sense with Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Incredible. Thank you so much Thank for joining Thank you so me. much, Abu Sadiq, for sharing God bless this knowledge. You. Thank you. Wow, what an amazing episode that was and so much knowledge in there for us to reflect on and learn from. And one of the uh, main things that become so powerful to me as Abu Sadiq was talking was that the reason why the Quran is not like a legal codex, why it's not a set of laws like the Ten Commandments, where laws come one after the other, but you see the laws coming in real time. So for example, when the Prophet Muhammad is with the children of Israel in Arabia and they are mocking him for worshiping in the direction of worship towards Jerusalem, he changes the direction of the Qibla. When he sees, for example, drunk Arabs coming to the prayer uh, uh, without their senses, he prohibits alcohol. Uh, when the prophets, the, the verse for his wives uh, to be behind the veil, it comes in real time as the situation is arising. And all of these uh, laws that the Prophet Muhammad makes, they come in his lifetime during particular events, and he sets them uh, as a law, as a lawgiver, with the power given to him by God himself. 
as so beautifully explained by Basalik. I really hope you contemplate on these words and you can see uh, the truth for what it is.